We'll call this meeting of the Silver City Town Council to order. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge Thank you. The next item on the agenda is proclamations, and I've got four of them, and I will have you all meet me at the podium one at a time. And the first up is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, April 2013. Let's see what the podium calling. So proclamation, whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month is intended to draw attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and has public health implications for every community member, and whereas rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment impact our community as seen by statistics indicating that one in four women and one in 20 men in New Mexico will experience rape or attempted rape in their lifetime, and whereas we must work together to educate our community about what can be done to prevent sexual assault and how to su support survivors. And whereas staff and volunteers at Silver Regional Sexual Assault Support Services encourage every person to speak out when witnessing acts of violence, however small. And whereas with leadership, dedication, and encouragement, there is compelling evidence that we can be successful in reducing sexual violence in Silver City through prevention, education, increased awareness, and holding perpetrators who commit acts of violence responsible for their actions. And whereas the Silver City Town Council strongly supports the efforts of national, state, and local partners and of every citizen to actively engage in public and private efforts, including conversations about what sexual violence is, how to prevent it, how to help survivors connect with services, and how every segment of our society can work together to better address sexual violence. Now, therefore, I, James R. Marshall, Mayor of the Town of Silver City, join anti-sexual violence advocates and support services programs in the belief that all community members must be part of the solution to end sexual violence. Along with the United States government and the state of New Mexico, I do hereby proclaim April 2013 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Colin. Thank you. Yeah. On, be, uh, on behalf of SAS, uh, we'd like to thank the council and the mayor for uh, signing this very important proclamation and drawing attention to this extremely important issue in our community. And uh, President Obama signed the proclamation as well today, so it's a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. The calendar? Um, I think I'm supposed to mention, ooh, as I knocked the whole po podium over. <laughs> We brought um, calendars about Sexual Assault Awareness Month and the activities that um, we're um, working on facilitating here in town. Um, I don't know if you guys want me to list them. No? Okay. So they're back there. Help yourselves and please come. Next up, Andy, on Child Abuse Prevention Month in Silver City. So proclamation, whereas we all have a responsibility as individuals, neighbors, community members, and citizens of Silver City to help create healthy, safe, and nurturing experiences for children, and whereas safe and healthy childhoods help produce confident and successful adults, and whereas child abuse and neglect often occurs when people find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and they do not know how to cope, and whereas the majority of child abuse cases stem from situations and conditions that are preventable in an engaged and supportive community. And whereas, child abuse and neglect can be reduced by making sure every family has the support they need and deserve to raise their children in a healthy environment. And whereas, it is recognized that no one person can do everything, but that everyone can do something. And together we can create change for the better. And whereas effective prevention programs succeed because of partnerships among agencies, schools, religious organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. 
and whereas displaying a blue ribbon in April will serve as a positive reminder that together we can prevent child abuse and keep children safe. Now therefore, I, James R. Marshall, Mayor of the Town of Silver City, do hereby proclaim April 2013 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Silver City, and I urge all citizens to engage in activities that strengthen families and communities to provide the optimal environment for children to learn, grow, and thrive, so that all children have the benefit of happy, healthy, and safe childhoods. Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank the mayor and council for recognizing child abuse as uh, something that can be prevented, something we can work on and collaborate with other providers like SAS and the Wellness Coalition tonight that are here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. It's a proclamation for Autism Awareness Month. Whereas autism is a lifelong neurological disorder with current statistics bringing it to 1 in 50 children being diagnosed, to, diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. And whereas autism affects each individual in different ways and can range from very mild to severe, knows no racial, ethnic, or social boundaries, and affects young and old alike. And whereas our outstanding our understanding of autism has grown tremendously since it was first diagnosed, there is no cure for no known cure for autism. Accurate early diagnosis and the resulting appropriate education and intervention are vital to the future growth and development of the individual. Whereas, hope lies in a broad spectrum of treatments and in an informed public and community committed to providing su support and service to individuals diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. And whereas, the Grant County Disability Advisory Council remains committed to their mission and to educating families, professionals, and the general public to better understand this lifelong disorder. And whereas we join with the Grant County Disability Advisory Council in proclaiming April 2013 as Autism Awareness Month. And now, therefore, I, James R. Marshall, Mayor of the Town of Silver City, Grant County, New Mexico, do, do hereby proclaim April 13 as Autism Awareness Month and encourage all residents of Silver City to become more educated about autism and support our neighbors and friends with disabilities by ensuring an inclusive community for all. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Mayor Marshall and the Council, for supporting us through this proclamation and other efforts that were ongoing uh, for the Disability Advisory Council. And then, as a parent of a child with autism, I really appreciate awareness coming to this issue in our community and also to the alarming statistics as the number of, of people diagnosed with autism increases every day. And I also brought you a ribbon. Colleen and her group, Colleen and her group are have it on, and you also are going to get a ribbon. Um, autism is represented by a puzzle. And the reason it is is because of the, the uh, diversity of people that are and families that are affected by autism, by the mystery of the disorder itself. And then the bright colors represent hope and that each person is an individual and we all will face some type of disability in our life and it gives us all hope. So I hope you'll accept my ribbon too. Yes. Thank you, Dan. Sorry about that. You thank you. And thank you for this. Thank you. Well, she does that. Tim, we're going to do a proclamation for Fair Housing Month. She just dropped something. <laughs> this is a proclamation, whereas fair and equal housing is a right guarantee to all Americans, and whereas the principle of fair and equal housing is not only a national law and policy, but a fundamental human entitlement, and whereas all citizens have the right to live where they choose within their financial means, and whereas people must not be denied housing because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, handicap, or family status. And whereas the town of Silver City acknowledges the importance of assuring fair and equal treatment to all citizens. And whereas the town of Silver City will display a fair housing exhibit at City Hall and the City Hall Annex. Now therefore I, James Marshall, Mayor of the town of Silver City, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2013 as Fair Housing Month and urge all citizens to participate in appropriate activities to commemorate this event.
I'm speaking representing Mike Ely this evening. He's the town's housing coordinator. Um, I know he would like to thank the council and the manager for their long-term support of both Vista La Plata and the housing rehab projects. And he's awfully happy that you have done that for so long and continue to do so. Also, um, Habitat for Humanity has become a, a real strong partner this year in the Vista La Plata program, so we want to thank them as well. Thank you. And I don't know how, but I lost my middle name on that last proclamation. <laughs> All of them said James R. except the last one. Does it? Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, so, we will move along under public input, and I invited the AmeriCorps volunteers from the Wellness Coalition to join us tonight. And if you want to come up to the podium, and I believe Brendan has some, or somebody's going to present real quickly. I remind you, uh, we got five minutes, and we'll, I'll try to give you a one-minute warning if you get close. My name is Timothy Miller. I'm uh, one of the Community Action Squad Youth Development Specialists at the Wellness Coalition. And once again, my name is Timothy Miller. I'm one of the Youth Development um, Specialist Community Action Squad members at the Wellness Coalition. And today, April 9, 2013, more than 830 mayors from all 50 states are standing together in support of the AmeriCorps programs by participating in the first ever Mayor's Day of recognition, recognition for the National Service. Together, these mayors represent nearly 100 million citizens, or nearly one-third of Americans. We are pleased to be here today with Mayor Marshall and the Town Council to ha highlight the Wellness Coalition's AmeriCorps program. Did you know that in the past three years alone, TWC has received over $2 million in federal, federal funding to support National Service in Grant County? and Southwest New Mexico. Each year, over 80 young adults serve their community, gain important job skills, and earn education awards for their college and job training. Uh, this is my second term with uh, the Wellness Coalition. Uh, a few things that I'm involved in are, is the Main Street Cleaning Crew, which is a six-month initiative to clean the sidewalks and sidewalk areas of downtown, downtown Silver City, and along with other youth mentoring and spot coverage responsibilities. I'm now going to kick it off to my co-worker, Melissa. Hello. My name is Melissa Cano, and I work for um, the AmeriCorps, or I'm an AmeriCorps member as well. Um, I work with the youth, and I work um, with Tim downtown as well. Um, uh, AmeriCorps members not only serve at TWC, but they also support 12 different nonprofit organizations, providing much need program support to help meet critical community needs. The Volunteer Center, Guadalupe Monastery Schools, HMS, Aldo Leopold Charter School, and other locations. AmeriCorps is an important complement to the wide range of TWC programming for youth and young adults. Programs such as the Youth Converse, cons, ah, Conservation Corps, Youth Volunteer Corps, Grant County Leader, Youth Leadership Program, and the SPA Youth Center. Every day, TWC AmeriCorps members are helping to make Silver City a stronger community. We appreciate your support. And this is my first term, and I really enjoy everything I've done so far. It's been an adventure. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Brendan Sorrelgreen, and I run the AmeriCorps program for the Wellness Coalition. Uh, and we actually operate in a four-county area in southwest New Mexico, including Luna, Hidalgo, Katrin, and Grant County. And we actually do have a host site in Sierra County as well, up in Tier C. And almost all of our programs are health-related or youth development-related. Um, and with that, we would appreciate it if we could get a picture with the mayor and potentially the other council members, uh, so that way we can make sure that Silver City is recognized on a national level. Thank you. We would be happy to, Brendan. Awesome. Thank you. You want us to line up down here, or where do you want us? Or the AmeriCorps members can probably get behind you, and that would work as well. That would so work too. Go for it, team. 
Come on up. We don't bite. Hard. <laughs> So, okay. Yeah. So, squash them together? Yeah. Can squash them together? Yeah, I thought it was going to fall on it. Then I just put the bomb in. Oh, yeah. It's like every two weeks. Yeah, I thought. Is this going to work or not? Yeah, it works. That actually works perfectly. Yeah, it works. Yeah, thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Next up, I have Faye McCalmont uh, regarding Comcast Cares. Good evening, members of the council, mayor, staff. Um, I'm here today to tell you about an exciting new project. The Arts Council is teaming up with Comcast and the town of Silver City, and we are creating a community mural on the bridge over Silva Creek. The mural is called Agua es la Vida, or Water is Life, and uh, we've been working with many of the um, elementary school students in town. They've been hearing oral histories of um, uh, uh, Pep Perotti, whose family lived on the creek, and uh, he gave them an oral history of what life was like living on the creek. They've also um, gotten a lot of information about the water cycle and how important our water is in this community. And so this is all going to be translated by the children into a very long um, multimedia mural across one side of the 12th Street Bridge. And um, we're teaming up with Comcast because every day they have a National Comcast Cares Day. Everyone who shows up and participates will earn $10 for the Arts Council youth mural program. Last year we were able to make $10,000 for the program. So we would very much like to have members of the council and the staff and the mayor, uh, if you're available, join us on that day. It's April 27th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, Comcast is going to generously serve hot dogs and sodas for lunch. And um, Everyone is going to be making a raindrop, a clay raindrop that will be added to the mural at some point. And so um, last year we did the many hands mural. Everyone had a hand on the, on the wall. This year it's going to be everyone's going to have a raindrop on the wall. So we just invite you to be there and everyone who's um, seeing this on CATS to join us on April 27th from 9 till 3. Thank you. Call that as my birthday party. Yeah. My birthday, so it'd be the biggest party I ever had. Go <laughs> pretend you all like me. <laughs> I'm not going to touch this. <laughs> Next on the agenda will be council comments. George? I, I thought he's going to do. Yeah. He's under reports. Council comments. Councilor Bettison, would you like to start? Um, no comments. Thank you. Councilor Cook? No comment. Thank you. Councilor Ray? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had a phone call, and uh, there's a group in Mountain View that has been picking up trash, and uh, they're very happy with the way the town council has been doing. And I've gotten some comments from other districts also that the town council and the mayor are doing a good job. So let's keep that up. Thank you. I'll try. <laughs> thank you, Councilor Morons. No comment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. In light of the extensive agenda, we'll move along. Does anybody have any changes to the agenda? No, sir. No. 
Hearing none, the agenda is approved. And next item on the agenda is approval of minutes of the regular meeting of the Silver City Town Council of March 26, 2013. Mr. Mayor. Council. I move to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of the Town Council of March 26, 2013. Mr. Mayor, I second that. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second and no discussion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of the Silver City Town Council of March 26, 2013. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is, do you want to do the, the listed reports? Will be reports, follow-up report of planning project for mine safety on Boston Hill, presented by Ken Romig, project manager Decker Parrish Sabatini, design contractor for abandoned mine lands program. You have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, Council Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to address you and give you an update on the planning process that took for, took place on March 21st. My name is Ken Romig, as, as was mentioned. I'm a project manager of a team of environmental environmental scientists, archaeologists, biologists, and uh, meeting facilitators uh, working with the Abandoned Mine Land Program, sometimes just referred to as AML. So if I just spout that, please, uh, please understand it's the Abandoned Mine Land Program of the Energy, uh, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department. Um, I hope just very quickly to brief you, I, I know you're all aware of our project, but just to give you a slight overview of what the Abandoned Mine Land Program is all about, just to remind you of that might be worthwhile before I get into the, um, the nitty gritty of our public meeting really quick. The Abandoned Mine Land Program is a federally funded state agency that uh, gets funding from a tax imposed upon existing coal mines. Their primary pri priority is to safeguard public health um, on those lands that have abandoned mines. And um, basically they are, um, their purpose is to safeguard hazards, immediate hazards in particular. AML has worked in Boston Hill in the past and it has considered Boston Hill to be a priority due to its proximity to Silver City and to its unique uh, abandoned mine features. AML funding sun sunsets in 2021 and is very reliant upon establishing partnerships with local governments and uh, jurisdictions in the maintenance and operations of any kind of safeguarding activity it engages in. Finally, I'll very quickly go over our scope of work. I mentioned once before um, when I talked with you on January 7th of this year that our, we have four phases of our work. The first is just to assess the existing conditions. The second is to plan. The third is to design and finally implement what might be chosen. And at that point, in January 7th, I mentioned that uh, the community could say to AML, we like Boston Hill the way it is. And they could ask AML to um, actually leave the project and allow the, the, uh, the conditions that currently exist on Boston Hill to be left as they are. And that was the focus of our public meeting um, on March 21st at the Silco Theater. Approximately 30 to 35 people attended this public meeting including landowners, the, uh, the representatives of the BLM, uh, some of the Youth Conservation Corps members attended, trail advocates and all sorts of other residents attended as well. It was a very well attended meeting. There was a short open house presentation and then a discussion period. I'll just cut to the chase and just mention some of our findings in terms of hazards up on, on uh, Boston Hill. Within Boston Hill, the open space proper, there are, and, and within our study region, which is approximately a mile beyond, well, it's not quite a mile, excuse me, it's more like a quarter mile beyond the open space boundary. We found that were, there were some shafts and attics that represented 
generally some hazards to be uh, mitigated. We also had a group of geo, um, uh, I guess they're called geotechnical engineers, looking at, specifically looking at the legal tender. And they found uh, a variety of hazards that were ranked from low to high. And they found hazards related to rock falls. If one were in the cave, there's, there's rock fall potentials. There's, of course, the fall from heights, which is difficult, and entrapment hazards. Some were very extreme, and some were actually experienced by the people within the, um, with, within the cave during a snowmelt period, rocks falling and that sort of thing. They also encountered some habitats off various bats in, in various locations. They also identified thin ceilings as thin as six feet that have the potential of falling. So we also presented some, some uh, simple implementation strategies that AML has used in the past to mitigate these hazards. And we had a, a very generous discussion with the community. Primarily, is, um, the focus was, again, whether we should continue our, our planning, our design and implementation of improvements that would safeguard the abandoned mine features. I could just very quickly go over four points, approximately, that the uh, community voiced. One, that attendees love Boston Hill and don't want to lose its roughness and the experience of risk. They, that is one of the things that defines the Boston Hill landscape. Nonetheless, they did recognize that Boston Hill has some safety hazards. Uh, they also requested that we don't change what doesn't need changing. Specifically, they wanted us to develop this, our team, and, and the Abandoned Mine Land Program, a, uh, a set of criteria that would uh, rank a feature that up on the Boston Hill area uh, by its habitat protection, perhaps the cost of mitigating the hazard, the level of hazard, approximate, uh, approximate, excuse me, proximity to trail trails as well. So essentially, what we'll be doing is creating a matrix with the with the features and the, um, the and basing or, or sort of prioritizing um, the safeguarding of certain features uh, based on a bunch of criteria, a series of criteria that's justifiable um, in the future. Attendees were enthusiastic about maintaining Boston Hill and. They were also uh, very interested in not missing this opportunity to have the Abandoned Mine Land Program um, continue its planning and design. Um, we all feel as if it was a successful meeting. And I'll just very quickly go over our next steps. The next steps is we will be developing a report for, for everybody's review and uh, perusal um, very soon. And we will also be conducting a uh, two-day workshop that with um, the community members who wish to attend to develop solutions that reflect um, the community consensus and reflect um, the aesthetic that is suitable to Boston Hill because that's a very important subject. Essentially that's uh, the end of my report. As, as was mentioned, every, the public requested that we continue our work, and um, I'm very much appreciative to have addressed you. Thanks, Ken. Any questions? No, sir. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Southwest New Mexico Green Chamber Quarterly Report by Sissy McAndrew, Executive Director and Company.
mayor, councilors, staff. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come up and do our uh, quarterly report. Um, uh, this is, uh, you have gotten these in your packets. Uh, this is looking at our monthly visitation. And once again, we're continuing to see this year that we uh, have less visitors than we have had previous years. Uh, as of this month, we are seeing an, an increase on the daily amount. Uh, one thing for March, uh, you can see we are starting to uh, get back up to where we were last year. And we also were not open, actually, on uh, Easter this year. Our two volunteers that we normally have had asked for the day off. Uh, what we do in that case is we did check the Silver City Museum was open, and so we put a notice on the door, and they are our backup uh, for uh, when we can't be open, and that's really a rare occasion. But uh, So we're feeling very confident. Uh, we think things are moving forward a great deal as far as the uh, new direction that tourism is taking, and George will be speaking with you in a moment about that. Uh, we also uh, put in your boxes, the new downtown guide from Main Street, which has uh, a new map in it. And uh, we've got 20,000 of these now to distribute in town, which we're real thrilled about. These are also going out to businesses downtown. We are continually trying to make sure people come over to the visitor center so they get all of the information. But in case they don't, these are also out in the community so people do have a guide to downtown. Uh, also, the new visitor's guide has come out since I last uh, reported to you, and these are moving very, very quickly. Uh, part of that being that we are getting more and more requests for mail-out information. Uh, we're getting increased requests not only through the magazines that we uh, get requests, but also we're getting a lot of phone calls. Uh, we're getting where people are requesting specific relocation packets. And I want to introduce Adrian Booth who is our uh, outreach assistant for the Visitor Center. She manages uh, all of the volunteers and also sees that the mailings get out. And what's wonderful is we are really sending people exactly what they need. And, uh, Mayor, you had one individual that had contacted you. We have followed up. Uh, we followed up immediately, and then we actually never heard back from the individual till yesterday, and Adrian spoke with him, and, and he is getting that information directly. Um, we uh, also get money from the county to help with the mailings and also to help. I will be going to the Governor's Conference on Tourism in May, and so that money helps us to do that. Uh, we continue to look for new volunteers. Uh, we have turnover. Of course, uh, sometimes people are ill. We have people that uh, will fill in those voids, but we're always looking for new volunteers, looking at training them working uh, right now with the university and trying to find interns. Um, but we do, we thank all of the volunteers. We've had uh, a thank you uh, reception for them on a Sunday. We try to keep them educated, especially with the events that are coming up in May. Uh, of course, we've got the tour of the Gila. We've got uh, the farmer's market starting on board. We've got the Mr. and Mrs. Golf Tournament, the Blues Festival. So we've got a lot coming down, and we try to keep them all updated on specific events so they have the answers. I uh, also want to mention the Buy Local campaign continues to move forward. And uh, to tie into that, I'd just like to at this point introduce uh, George Dwaran, who is the Arts and Cultural District Director and uh, he can let you know some of the uh, uh, areas that he's moving forward on, and then if you've got any questions, we could answer those together. George? Mayor, council, and staff, uh, thank you on behalf of Arts and Cultural District for having me, uh, allow me to present again. Um, it, uh, First of all, I want, I want to acknowledge Sissy and Adrian and Green Chamber and all the volunteers at the Visitors Center. Um, they do a tremendous job uh, every day, and uh, 
they do it uh, sight unseen, and um, it's 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 really fabulous, and uh, it's it's wonderful to be working with with the Green Chamber and all that they do. Um, in terms of the statistics, I also have to say that in uh, in my first quarter, I'm in my ninth week, so I haven't been with the uh, Arts and Cultural District for the full quarter. But one of the areas that I have gone in search of is uh, uh, validation and statistical metrics of uh, tourism to our region. And I have to, again, acknowledge the, the Visitor Center and the work that the Green Chamber is doing in their statistical compiling. I think it's one of the um, more sophisticated presentations um, and consistent gathering of information. And uh, I, I, I think it's very important, the work that they're doing, to help us uh, get a glimpse of how and where our advertising and marketing is yielding and who is visiting our community so that we know uh, what audience to continue to reach out to and areas where we might expand on that. So thank you, Sissy and Adrian, in particular. Um, I have a lot. I have a lot going on and a lot to report. So I'm going to keep it very brief, and um, I will have even more uh, in the next quarter to report to you. Um, we. I continue to focus my first 90 days on the assets and obligations of the Arts and Cultural District to uh, assure that the ACD is a sound, well-run organization particularly fiscally, and that we continue uh, to be a well-entrusted steward of lodgers' tax dollars to promote tourism. Uh, on the asset side, I, I've been meeting with lots of the, the uh, locals to listen, and uh, I, I believe people are our greatest assets. But I also have been spending a fair amount of time in uh, bringing the best, most talented uh, creative talent locally uh, to uh, to the effort of increasing tourism and specifically in advertising. Uh, in that effort, I've been working closely with uh, ACD Tourism Group, composed of lodgers, business owners, event planners, and community leaders, which meets every other month to discuss, review, brainstorm strategies for advertising and marketing. I've met with this group twice now. Um, we've already been analyzing what opportunities lay ahead, what's worked, what hasn't, um, specifically for the new fiscal year. Uh, one area, a great emphasis that uh, you'll hear from me about continually going forward is the opportunities that, uh, that present themselves specifically on the Internet, World Wide Web, and SilverCityTourism.org. I think it's our most cost-effective means for expanding our outreach efforts. I believe that uh, our print advertising today is largely designed specifically to drive traffic to the website where we can create a visitor experience that's more enticing and more encompassing than what a perhaps a two-second two print advertisement can do. You'll hear more about SilverCityTourism.org going forward. Um, in, uh, in, in print advertising in the first quarter, we placed 13 ads in local, regional, state, and one national publication. This number is uh, relatively low in part because the ACD was, out, was uh, without leadership until my start date of February 1. You can expect that when I report to you again, you'll see increased numbers for, for print advertising. We're also, I've already initiated some uh, some new methods by which we can track uh, our print advertising response rates since the reply card method is sort of a, a, a dinosaur today. Um, so again, it, it's how we, how we drive traffic and follow traffic to the Internet. Um, we've also uh, positioned ourselves via Internet radio, and we've been featured on Big Blend Radio um, three times in the last quarter. Um, I've been part of two radio shows. Um, the most recent was this last Sunday when they focused on the Silver City uh, Clay Festival, the signature event of the Arts and Cultural District now in its second year. 
Um, it was a, a real success. It was their Champagne Sunday. They pulled together about six people from uh, related to who are part of the Clay Festival, um, which is now expanding its its participants nationally. Um, I'll allow Lee Gruber to speak to that when she presents to you uh, in her in her time. Um, but uh, it was tremendous, and um, uh, uh, it's it's another way that we can we can continue to outreach is via radio. In addition, we've been active. At, I've been active at the state level. I've been collaborating with six other or uh, five other arts and cultural districts to create community uh, cross community tourism promotions. I visited Santa Fe twice, once in partner, um, once to partner uh, with five other ACDs to apply for New Mexico tourism grant money to collectively advertise throughout the state. The idea uh, of uh, for New Mexico travelers to enjoy a diverse array of arts and cultural districts and to promote the idea that if you're on a driving tour in New Mexico to visit not only Silver City but uh, Raton, Albuquerque, Taos, Las Vegas, and Los Alamos. Um, and uh, in, in that effort, every time I've been to Santa Fe and I've been working with these other arts and cultural districts, um, Silver City shines as a, as a really prime example in the work that we've been doing to promote tourism. Um, uh, also, the... Um, the ACD submitted our application to continue receiving funding from the state to promote local tourism via the New Mexico True Campaign, which is significantly added this past year to expanding our advertising efforts and maximizing our larger tax dollars. I'll be presenting to the state in two weeks as part of that application process. Uh, the ACD Steering Committee, I'd like to point out also, is a wonderful group. Um, has been doing some great work recently, and I want to highlight one one perfect example of how the ACD is also partnering with our local community. Um, the Red Paint Powwow presented to the group a month ago and was looking for input on how they might improve their funding and attendance at the powwow. In true collaborative spirit, which I think is the you know the essence and mission of Arts and Cultural District, several partners have met with the powwow leadership to brainstorm how this excellent cultural event uh, can survive and thrive and continue to bring in regional and uh, regional tourists to our area. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I, I, I feel myself again. Um, so uh, the... Um, and then again at the state level, I'm going to be attending the uh, the governor's conference on tourism with Sissy, and uh, I'll be networking in the effort to promote us as a wonderful tourist destination. And lastly, uh, coming back to SilverCityTourism.org, it continues to show evidence of its effectiveness. Uh, we draw uh, regular, on average, about. 2,500 to 3,000 unique visitors to the website monthly. Um, one of our, I have to thank the town of Silver City uh, as one of the drivers of traffic to the tourism site. In fact, the number one uh, referral site is the town of Silver City. Um, and so thank you for your efforts on that behalf. Um, we, uh, in the metrics I'm seeing, uh, we continue to draw regularly from uh, visitors from Tucson, Phoenix, El Paso, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Las Cruces, as well as far away as Hawaii and New York City. Um, and I believe that uh, those local cities are proof that the I-10 and I-25 corridor advertising, which you'll hear me speak to um, uh, again in the future, is extremely effective. We have, uh, we're a driving destination. They're, they only have really two major corridors through which they can arrive here. And uh, by continuing to uh, focus our advertising in, in, on those cities, um, we have the potential of reaching 10 million plus visitors who can be here by lunch. Um, and hopefully then we can convince them to stay the weekend. Um, 
you'll hear me talk more about all of this in the future. I've been in meetings. I've been listening. I've been reaching out to the community. The community has reached back and welcomed me in this position in a tremendous fashion. I thank all of them. Uh, I have been receiving all kinds of feedback on uh, the wonderful uh, possibilities of Silver City and the area. And one of the uh, outcomes of that is asking everybody what it is that they love about Silver City. Um, it's led to a potential campaign of Silver City, the 101 things to do in Silver City. We're well into the 200s now. Um, and uh, so there's no shortage of what we can, we can offer when people do arrive here. Thank you for your time. Thanks, George. Do you have any questions at all? I'll just say I, I have a, a history of accosting tourists on the streets downtown and interviewing them. And I, I think I had mentioned this before you took this job, George, but I asked some people from, I think it was Idaho, that were up and down Bullard, and I watched them for a while, and Councillor Bettison was, was with me that particular evening, and we, I got to talking to them, and I'm, I'm giving them the, the drill, and they're really getting uncomfortable why this stranger is <laughs> asking all these questions. So some of the questions I asked them were, how did you find Silver City, and what, what brought you here when you did find us, and it was the, the 101 things to do. And then I followed that with, did we meet your expectation when you got here? Mm. And they said that and more. Okay. And I think that's really important because they're going to come back. And they'll come back over and over, and they'll pass it around all over Idaho that there was plenty to be entertained by in Silver City. And it was also that particular evening I don't know what they were doing but they were back and forth they were in a car and out of a car and they stopped I think three police officers on Bullard and asked for directions and stuff about Silver City I know one of the, the stops was to find the Catholic Church because they had seen the the architecture that you find all over New Mexico in our, in our Catholic churches so they wanted to go see ours mm -hmm. and it was it was very interesting to, to listen to what they had to say and, and make sure that we're not misrepresenting Silver City in our advertising. And lastly, real quick, are we going to start doing advertising in Chinese? <laughs> in Chinese, I, I hadn't considered that. My Chinese is a little rough, but we are looking at Spanish. I just saw <laughs> today, I believe, that Asia has surpassed Europe in tourist huh. dollars spent around the world. Wow. So. We well, may have a new market. We'll, we'll look for translators. We have a lot going on with the state as well when we're talking about some of those foreign markets. And uh, I want to mention the, the RVs. We, I don't know if you've noticed it, but a lot of other people have mentioned to me that RV market is coming back through, and that's because we have a listing in the RV Journal, which uh, also lists events, and that's one that we're starting to get that flow of RVs. Uh, the local businesses are starting to feel, especially the restaurants, are feeling real good about uh, where their numbers are. Uh, we also have a Cinco de Mayo for the first time this year. Uh, the Chicano Music Fest mm -hmm. is going to be holding that downtown. Main Street is doing a lot, uh, another one of our key partners. And uh, I think those are the sorts of things where we're hopefully going to start seeing that turnaround in our economy because we are working, we are collaborating, we're trying to find the answers, and then we're going out and really implementing. So it's making a big difference, and I think you can tell how thrilled I am to have George. He's, he's a great partner, and I, I think we're just going to see things continue to get better for our community. I was just going to say that the mayor brought up something, and um, simply because I was just yesterday in Hawaii, and I can tell you that the I was at a conference <laughs> for archaeology, but I have to tell you that the hotel uh, where I stayed, and actually the, the state of Hawaii, um, it's it really caters to to um, you know uh, Chinese and Japanese, and um, I know that 
um, when I used to work in Arizona as an archaeologist, um, there'd be a lot of Japanese tourists going to the Grand Canyon and going to see the, uh, the Petrified National Forest. And when I first started here, we'd actually get Japanese tourists all the way down here, and that was 23 years ago. So they wanted to see the true West. It was they, they were coming because they don't really have this vastness of land, so um, it would be interesting to, to try to get that market, at least a little bit of that market share back. Certainly consider that. I hope you don't mind if I follow up. I, I acknowledge, Mayor, um, the, the necessity of representing authentic Silver City. Um, we, the worst thing we could do is have uh, is to promote ourselves and have people show up and overpromise and underdeliver. We we are unique for what we are, and we want that to shine. And I think the other thing you hit on is the you'll hear me say it again and again. Our greatest asset is our people, and our people make the experience. It's not the places, the buildings, all of that is wonderful ambiance, but it's encompassed by the experience that they have with the people that they encounter in Silver City. And, and I believe that our greatest potential for marketing is them going back and telling somebody else about that. Adrian would also like to talk, I uh, think, about the uh, visitation from other markets. Yeah, um, my name is Adrian Booth, and I help um, manage day-to-day -day operations at the visitor center. I help coordinate volunteers. And I wanted to specifically address Mayor Marshall and Councilor Bettison's questions about international tourism. During the past year, we've had visitors from all 50 United States, um, we've had visitors from at least 30 foreign countries. And this past month alone, we've had many visitors from um, many European countries, the United Kingdom, uh, Germany in particular, but also from Iceland. We've had visitors from Indonesia. We have had visitors from Japan in the past year. And we had visitors from Pretoria, South Africa last week. We do attract diverse visitors. I think we can do a better job of reaching out to some of those communities and certainly um, to Asian markets. Uh, but I think we're on track. And one of the things we do at the Visitor Center is we want to make sure that when people come in, we address their questions to give them relevant answers and to make sure it's a personalized experience. So if they're interested in um, you know, the Wild West, Old Western history, we help them find that in Silver City. We want them to have a good experience here, and we want to provide accurate, educated answers to them. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. states, does that mean Texas is not in the international column? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And Thank please you. share with the, the volunteers down there that you know, I, I think I can speak on, at least on behalf of the council, that we truly appreciate the time and effort that they spend down at the visitor center, and it's a very valuable service to the town. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your feedback. Thank you. Staff reports, Mr. Brown. Nothing today. Thanks. Chief. Any report? Does it help if I turn it on? Anything from community development? Oh, all right. You guys okay with me? No. I'm going to go here. Councilor Bettison. You better do it now. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a um, Mayor Marshall, I move for a short break. Just a second. Uh, Mayor Marshall, I second that. There's a motion and a second for a short break. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll be in a short recess. <laughs> we'll call this meeting back to order, and the next item on the agenda is a public hearing entitled Approval Disapproval of Ordinance Number 1217, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map for the following properties from the commercial or residential B districts. 
to the mixed use zoning districts. All of blocks 243, 254, 267, and 268 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City, the east 74 feet of lots 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 of block 256 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City, the east 70 feet of lots 1 and 3 of block 266 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City, the west portion of Block 276 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City, bordered on the east by the town-owned right-of-way in Pino Saltos Creek, and including the vacated portion of 15th Street as described in Ordinance Number 702, all of Blocks 1 and 6 of Shadow Subdivision. The applicant is the Town of Silver City. The Town Council will serve as the hearing board, and I, as Mayor, will be the presiding officer. Have any members of this hearing board had ex parte discussion with any person regarding the subject matter of this hearing or had any communication from any party to this case? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Hearing none, we're all qualified. Will all parties and witnesses intending to testify, including those staff members who intend to present testimony or who will be available for questioning, please rise and come to the podium to be sworn in by the town clerk. If you have not been sworn, you will not be permitted to testify or otherwise participate in this hearing. I swear. Please raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I, state your name. I, Jamie Indic. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That the testimony I am about to give. That the testimony I am about to give. In the matter before this council. In the matter before this council. Is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Under penalty of perjury. Under penalty of perjury. The hearing will be conducted as follows. The town staff shall present a brief synopsis of the application based on the application or actions taken by the director. Wow. <laughs> By PNZ Commission or by town staff, then the applicant shall present their case. Next will come witnesses in support of the applicant's case. The applicant staff or witnesses may then be questioned by the hearing board. The presiding officer will then ask the applicant if that concludes its case in chief and states that the proponent and its witnesses will remain available to be further questioned by the hearing board, by staff, or by opponents to the application. Following the close of the applicant's case, witnesses in opposition to the applicant's case shall be permitted to testify during the course of which the witness may address questions to any previous witness, but such questions shall be made through the presiding officer. The presiding officer shall have the sole discretion in directing the question for response, considering whether the question is relevant, is cumulative to other testimony, or is otherwise inappropriate. At the close of testimony against the application, the presiding officer will ask the applicant, is there anything else you wish to be reflected in the record? And then we will ask the hearing board if they're prepared to make a decision. You may proceed. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. This is Zone Change 12-08 from Commercial to Mixed Use. Uh, the area in question right now is Zoned Commercial, which falls under the default zoning of Commercial Highway. The Mixed Use District is uh, intended to accommodate a larger mix of uses, and housing is also included in the uses that are available. This is the area that is going to be changed for the proposal. There's also a larger map on the wall if anybody would like to look at it. Um, this area here that is a peninsula is right across the street from um, a commercial area that won't be included in the RV park. This is the way it's currently zoned. The white area is the proposal area. The blue and whiter sections are properties that have already requested individually to be changed. So it's trying to encompass an area uh, along with the request of the council and the mayor to have zoning reflect more of what is on the ground. So this will be the first use of the mixed use zoning category. Um, there are homes in the area, also um, some mobile homes. Uh, Brocom used to be in this, but now I think they'll be moving with their merger. Um, this is just another example of the properties that have already requested individual zone changes. So we're trying to follow um, 
the request of the property owners. Some of the examples of uses allowed in commercial highway, which this property is zoned right now, that are not allowed in mixed use are truck stops, bus and railroad depots, and contractor's yards. That gives you an idea of the types of uses in commercial that aren't allowed in mixed use. Single family homes and accessory dwelling units are allowed in mixed use as well as multi-section manufactured homes. Um, the findings required when the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Town Council make their re recommendation, they shall have at least one of the following findings. Would you like me to read them into the record, Mr. Mayor? That's okay. Yes? They're, they're in the record. Okay. And this has been, this is month four of this process. We've already been through public open houses and the Planning and Zoning Commission. And the Planning and Zoning Commission found that this map amendment zone change meets findings one, two, four, and seven of the required findings. Do you have any questions? Anything you'd like to see again? Any questions? I noticed, I think I saw in the picture that there are some single whites. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. They would be grandfathered in. They're right here. These three. They're, here's the RV park and they're across the street from the RV park. And then I think there are a few um, in the Swan Street area and right here also. So a lot of them have been there for years and years and years. There, there haven't been any new ones placed there. And they weren't allowed in the commercial? No, they're not. Residences are not allowed in the commercial. So it's just, it was really a, a bad zoning to begin with? Well, less refined zoning. That was tactful. So this is our first use of the mixed use zone. And the portion of the street that was vacated of 15th Street is right along here. And we use the creek as the boundary and 16th Street to the north because there's a higher intensity commercial use with the bank and uh, Silver Heights Boulevard to the north. And you'll notice down here there are a lot more single section homes. We may look at some residential B down there. And, and then this is residential A, a lot of that is. Just curious, what's on the, on the right? in the little wing? This? Yes. Homes. And the portion of 15th Street was that was vacated, I believe, belongs to this parcel. I do have a parcel map with me if you'd like to look at it. I, I'm just curious why it didn't stop on the street. It does. It's just hard to show on the map when it's blown up. It distorts it a little bit. The street up here? The north or right here? Right there. Um, because of the type of uses right here, we, in, we use the creek as a natural boundary. It's easier to do than the other side of the street. But we could, there were also um, people that live right here that came to our public meeting, and they think it's just more continuity of the neighborhood to have that included. That's the reason for this small peninsula here also. And the reason this is cut out is it's the RV park and it's not allowed in mixed use. So you just use the creek because it's a natural mm -hmm. break between two zones? Yes, it, it seems to naturally, kind of like 16th Street up here, naturally seems to separate the more residential, smaller commercial uses from the larger. Council. So what's directly underneath the north arrow that you have right there? Is that residences? See the north arrow? Up in there? Up here? Yeah. Um, there's a couple residences here and then some empty lots. And the owner of this lot where my mouse arrow is, yeah. 
um, did not want to be included. Okay. They did come to our public meetings and they did not want to be included. They want to keep theirs um, commercial. Okay. So and then this over here is that body shop and yeah. it used to be a plumbing place there. Yeah. That's why I was wondering. Mm -hmm. about any, yeah, about that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we left it um, commercial because it's closer to the highway. Uh, the highway here. Okay. And also at the request of the property owners that did come to the open house. Well, and that clarifies it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I assume you're speaking on behalf of the town staff and the applicant. Yes. <laughs> Is there any other witnesses in support of the applicant's case? Seeing none. Any applicants in opposition to the applicant's case? Seeing none. Is there anything else you wish to be reflected in the record? No, sir. Does that conclude your case in chief? Yes, sir. Does any member of the hearing board have any questions for the witness? No, sir. Is the hearing board prepared to consider this application and render its decision? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move for approval of ordinance number 1217, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map for the following properties from the commercial or residential B districts to the mixed use zoning district. All blocks. 243, 254, 267, and 268 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City. The east 74 feet of lots 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 of Block 256 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City. The east 70 feet of lots 1 and 3 of Block 266 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City. The west portion of Block 276 of the Fraser Survey of the Town of Silver City bordered on the east by the town-owned right-of-way in Pinos Altos Creek and including the vacated portion of 15th Street as described in Ordinance Number 702. All blocks, all of the blocks 1 and 6 of Shadle's subdivision with finding number... One, the proposed amendment is in substantial compliance with the town's comprehensive plan. Mr. Mayor, the second the motion is stated. Is there a motion and a second? Is there any discussion? No, sir. No, sir. There's a motion and a second and no discussion to approve ordinance number 1217 as read twice tonight and published with finding number one the proposed amendment is a is in substantial compliance with the town's comprehensive plan roll call councilor moronis aye councilor ray aye councilor cook aye councilor benson aye motion carries and that concludes this hearing Thanks, James. The next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of special dispenser permit application for the Members Regional Arts Council's 18th Annual Silver City Blues Festival to be held May 24th through the 26th, 2013 on 12th and Pope Street adjacent to Goff Park Liquor License Holder Buffalo Bar to 11 North Bullard. Silver City, New Mexico. Ms. McCalmont, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and staff, you have before you the request to approve the special dispensers permit um, for the beer garden at the 18th annual Silver City Blues Festival. And um, I also included in your packet the map with the new um, layout for the festival site. 
and we've put quite a bit of effort into this to try to help ease the crowding in the park for public safety. Um, I've worked with the chief um, and um, Peter Pena, and we feel like we've come up with some pretty good solutions. I've also worked with Councillor Ray as helping me with uh, relocating all of the motorcycles uh, to a, a new parking area there, so um, we're kind of excited about that. But we do feel that the beer garden is located in the best in the best spot for it, and um, we hope to receive your approval for that this evening. Do you have any questions for me? I don't know if Councillor Ray speaks for all the motorcyclists in town. <laughs> I would love to have your help too, Mr. Mayor. I guess it'll be tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, Councillor? Uh, uh, you have all the artisans. They will be on Pope Street now. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, yeah, and there here. will be none in the park. Right, we're moving everybody out of the park so that we can free up the park for the people who were there to hear the music. And um, we're creating like a vendor alley. We're going to have some shade and tables there. And we think that providing shade is going to be particularly important now that we've had to have the trees removed from the park. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have been calling and asking about it. And, of course, you know, they're just going to have to fend for themselves, <laughs> but uh, without blocking everybody else's view, hopefully. Um, but so we're going to provide an area there with tables and chairs that people can eat in there. They can sit in there, and hopefully that'll kind of draw people over to the new area. We're going to create huge banners on the um, on the street lights poles there that you know, uh, letting people know that's where the vendor area is now. And so we're going to do our best to make it into a really vibrant location for them. And hopefully, um, uh, you know, I know it's, change is difficult for everybody, but um, I think in a few years nobody will even remember they were in the park. <laughs> That's my hope anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? Entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move for approval of a special uh, dispenser permit application for the Members Region Arts Council's 18th Annual Silver City Blues Festival to be held May 24th through the 26th, 2013 on 12th and Pope Streets adjacent to Goff Park, liquor license holder Buffalo Bar, uh, 211 North Bullard, Silver City, New Mexico. Is there a second? Mr. Mayor. I'll second it as well. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second to approve the special dispenser permit application for the Members Regional Arts Council's 18th Annual Silver City Blues Festival with liquor license holder Buffalo Bar at 211 North Silver North Bullard in Silver City, New Mexico. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I bet you were scared when you looked at the agenda. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of bid number 12-13-10, homeowner rehabilitation project, Mr. Brown. Um, the town uh, put out a project uh, bid 12-13-10, uh, uh, a homeowner's rehabilitation uh, project. Um, originally it was staff's recommendation to award the project uh, <clears throat> because the funds are available for the award in the grant uh, but um, when the project uh, the bid was sent up to MFA uh, they told us that uh, because it exceeded the uh, estimated cost for the project by more than 10% uh, that we had to put it back out to bid and the reason actually it's, it's, it's not a bad bid the, the problem is is that uh, during the um, the review process, the uh, contractor actually went through and found some additional problems, and he included that inside inside the the uh, bid that he proposed. But it was not included in the estimate for the cost of the project. So what it, staff is recommending that we uh, reject the bid and put it out for the minimum days uh, required because the contractors already know what's, uh, what additional work needs to be done and then bring it back to the council at the next meeting. 
Counselor. I move that we reject bid number 12-12-13-10, Homeowner Rehabilitation Project, for staff's recommendation. Is that appropriate? I second that motion. There's a motion and a second to reject the bid 12-13-10, Homeowner's Rehab Project, for staff recommendation. Any discussion? There's a motion and a second. No discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is approval, disapproval of fiscal year 2013-2014 budget presentation by Alex C. Brown, Town Manager, Finance Director, and request for council's direction. We'll tell you where to go. We'll tell you where to go. Okay. I know. Mayor and Council, as you know, I'm going to go over briefly where I'm at right now with the water sewer, the sanitation, and the general fund. Of course, the general fund is the fund that provides the funding for the majority of the services that the town provides. And the water sewer and sanitation fund are basically enterprise funds, which basically should be run as sort of like a business, a non-profit business, because it isn't for profit. But currently, the way that the rate, the ordinances describe how the rate is to be developed for the water sewer fund is that annually I'm supposed to bring to you any rate recommendation, rate change recommendations that may be required to get the fund to where it needs to be. Last year, an ordinance was passed that required that the water revenue rates be adjusted annually so that it covered all operational debt service and capital costs, as well as develop a one-twelfth reserve. We're not going to get to the one-twelfth reserve this year because water, the billing for water has decreased the number of gallons that we've been billing for. The number of gallons pumped has been decreasing as well, is less than what I projected last year. So the revenues that I projected, we're not going to hit that this year. But we still have the same operating costs that we have, I projected. We also have the same debt service costs, as well as probably some increased capital costs because of some increased costs because of the Gabby Hayes well that took longer than expected to get online. So where I'm at right now is the first page for the rate structure. Currently, the rate structure is we charge $10.25 for the first 3,000 gallons and then $3.44 from 3,000 to 13,000 gallons and then $4.21 for anything over 13,000 gallons. That's for in-town rates. Out-of-town rates is $18.02 for the first 3,000 gallons, $5.90 for the next 10,000 gallons, $6.98 for anything above that. What I propose is to increase the number of billable gallons by decreasing the base rate from 3,000 gallons to 2,000 gallons. So that's going to increase a certain amount of residents to get into that first tier faster. And then what I'm also recommending is to increase the first tier. We'll change the first tier from 3,000 gallons to 13,000 gallons, change that from 3,000 gallons to 10,000 gallons, 10,000 gallons. So it's going to be the next 7,000 gallons. So it would be the first 2,000 gallons and then the next 8,000 gallons in the first tier, and then anything over that would be in the third tier. And then to increase the 
second tier uh, by 20 cents from 344 to 364 and then the uh, third tier from 421 to 351 uh, which would be a 20 cent increase and a 30 cent increase uh, on the out of town rates I'm recommending again that we maintain the current base rate but again go down to 2,000 gallons for the base rate change the second tier for the next 8,000 gallons and it would increase uh, 20 cents as we did uh, with the in town rates and the uh, third tier second tier would go up 30 cents the same way what this would do would uh, I got an estimate uh, from the utility billing department it would, currently we have uh, 6,243 accounts that we bill uh, that does include the fact that uh, three of those accounts are the water associations because we directly bill uh, Tyrone they are the fourth water association but we direct, directly bill them and uh, that's included uh, in our the rates that I'm proposing uh, the if you include the water associations we have a total of uh, 6,941 accounts that we that are tied on to our water system uh, the the base rate uh, I went off of actually to, to go a little bit farther back um, there was a recommendation on the uh, water conservation plan uh, during its first phases of, of development um, it's not done yet but uh, part of that plan uh, did recommend that we decrease the number of gallons in the first uh, tier to promote water conservation and to shorten the, the next well, the base as well as first tier so we get people into the third tier more quickly to help promote water conservation um, as far as the number of people accounts we estimate that would would fall into the get the uh, uh, fall into the uh, being built for the, for the third three thousand gallons the third thousand gallons uh, of the 6200 accounts uh, we estimated about 500 accounts would be fall into that that area so we're, we're that's about 600,000 gallons uh, that would be built automatically it's not really that much it's only about uh, an additional revenue of $26,000 uh, at this rate structure um, so if, if we look at it uh, the way we compare uh, our billing to the rest of the state is that uh, we use an average of 6,000 gallons currently we use an uh, it costs $20.57 for the first 6,000 gallons that's built under this proposal it would go up to $24.81 so that would be a, an increase of uh, $4.30 well 28 cents uh, so that's what we're looking at compare that to the state average for 6,000 gallons last year the only criteria that we information that we have to compare against is last year's rates this does not include any rates that were increased at the beginning of the, of the current fiscal year but the, the state average was $25.85 for the first 6,000 gallons okay so um, that's the first uh, area that I, I looked at as far as the, the rate structure for um, the water sewer fund next uh, we sort of use the same criteria for uh, water I mean sewer and uh, wastewater rates um, basically the base rate for sewer has to cover the debt service costs associated with uh, sewer um, so uh, because of the debt service for the uh, associated with sewer isn't changing I'm not recommending changing the base rate for that but because of uh, increased uh, capital costs uh, for uh, upgrades to the infrastructure regular maintenance um, I am recommending that we do increase the uh, per thousand gallons uh, for the um, uh, in-town rates from 
one ten to a uh, dollar twenty per thousand gallons, and then the wastewater would go from one eighty to uh, two oh one per thousand gallons. So, if you look on the second sheet under the wastewater rates, uh, for 2014, that would cover us by $17,000 for debt service, uh, uh, operational uh, costs, as well as I also applied 50% uh, of the gross receipts that's dedicated to, um, so, uh, Right now, we, we uh, supplement the water sewer fund with uh, one-eighth gross receipts tax, and that's uh, approximately well, one-eighth amounts to $424,000 annually at our, current, at our current rate of, of revenue. So um, I am subsidizing that a little bit with the gross receipts taxes. It is my plan to hopefully get the rate structure to a point by after uh, within the second year, this is the first year after the hold harmless has been eliminated, that we can pull back this one eighth that we have subsidizing the water sewer fund, move it from the water sewer fund back into the general fund to alleviate some of the shortfalls that we will start seeing in the future years because of the elimination of the, of the hold harmless. So this is the first step to getting to that point. Uh, so, um, if you go to the next page, what I'm projecting is uh, total revenues of $5,630,771 with transfers out uh, currently uh, in the amount of 738184 which all goes to uh, debt service for uh, the, the well, the SCADA system, the Gabby, uh, no, that's that the little walnut, wall, little walnut sewer, and then they also do pay part of the debt service for the 2011 bonds. Okay. Uh, this budget uh, projection uh, recommended budget uh, expenditures is four million six hundred thirty-five thousand three hundred three dollars. Uh, that would leave us a remaining cash balance of two hundred fifty-seven thousand two hundred eighty-four thousand. Uh, $128,991 short of the 112th reserve. So as far as the personnel that's remaining the same, debt service is remaining the same. Capital and maintenance is increasing a little bit because of our older infrastructure. Uh, we want to uh, catch it uh, within the operating budget rather than hold off and then have to borrow the money to do big projects and put it into um, the debt service. So we want to keep up with things as, as um, things starting to deteriorate within the fund. Uh, do you have any questions or comments about uh, the direction that I'm heading within this fund? No questions? Our water bill's going up. Yes. The, the average bill would go up $7 a month. That includes both. That, that's both. Yeah. The, uh, well, it's a little bit over seven. I think it's seven and twenty-three on the average. Well, I, none of us enjoy raising rates or taxes, but this is and should be operated as a true enterprise fund. At which point, it's not. And with the looming hold harmless. If we can get this into a true enterprise fund, which moves the general fund out of supporting this fund, hopefully it will set us up for a smaller tax increase to respond to the whole harmless. Uh, yeah, and that's what I, you know, through the whole this session, I've been running different scenarios, and that this was basically sort of. Next to worst case scenario, worst case was them eliminating the whole harmless right away. Um, this is taking one of the steps to um, uh, mitigate some of the the uh, impact on the general fund, which is the fund that is being impacted the most by the whole harmless uh, situation. 
And our rates are low. Yeah, our, our rates are low, especially the water sewer rates. If you compare them to anybody in South uh, West New Mexico, they are probably half, a little bit less than half of what they pay in the others. Well, you know, I haven't been on council for a while. This has been a plan all along was to move this so that the enterprise fund, like the mayor said, is actually paying for itself rather than us <laughs> taking from the general fund. So this, it, it's not a surprise. I mean, I think that's the reason why, you know, council action was taken so that we would review this annually rather than do big, huge increases but to do smaller ones um, that would gradually move it toward it being a balance, you know, the fund funding itself. Yes, and I, I think what helps um, with our water system is the fact that we, we um, provide water outside of our, uh, our uh, territorial boundaries. So um, everyone shares. So rather than 10,300 residents sharing in the cost of this increase, it's, a, it's close to 20,000 residents that we provide water to that are helping share in the increase here. So um, our local residents aren't being as impacted as they would be under other circumstances. So that does help. Thank you. He's referring to those people that don't vote for me. <laughs> but could. <laughs> yes. Um, now, going on, do you have, the next page is, is basically the summary page of everything there. Um, I do want to say that um, as far as the expenses, uh, the water sewer fund and the sanitation fund, there there is some salary increases that are, that are contractually obligated uh, from union because of the ASME union, um, as well as um, part of the legislation that passed this year was uh, raising the PERA costs. So the town is taking up uh, our total portion, which is a half of a percent plus uh, three quarters of the uh, employees increase as well. And then uh, Insurance is increasing by an average of four and a half percent. So the town pays eighty percent of the employees' insurance, and we are uh, increasing our portion by four and a half percent. In the water sewer fund, uh, just the PERA and um, and the insurance is uh, seventy-eight thousand dollars, a little bit more than seventy-eight thousand dollars increase. Okay. Now the sanitation fund. Uh, here, there's, it doesn't. Ordinance doesn't require me to make recommendations because uh, the ordinance uh, already uh, maintains an automatic three percent rate increase annually. Um, I, I'll have to look until when that. In fact, I think it's perpetual right now. So it, it has that three percent uh, rate increase. So. What we're doing is looking at a beginning cash balance of $50,000, uh, basically taking uh, current uh, revenue, the revenues that we're receiving, and extrapolating that out through the rest of the year, uh, adding 3% to that. Uh, also, I do want to mention that in the water sewer fund, other revenue sources are, there is a 1 16th percent gross receipts taxes that is dedicated to the waters, I mean to the sanitation fund, but that is through state legislation. That one can't be moved. If that's adopted, that is strictly dedicated to the sanitation fund. That's about $207,000 that gross receipts is subsidizing the sanitation fund. Um, so uh, if you look at the tipping fees, uh, tipping fees in the sanitation fund are approximately these are landfill fees. The cost that it takes to take, take in everything to the landfill is on average about $500,000 a year. So it only pays for about half of, half of that. Uh, the projected uh, revenue, oh, then there's others for, you know, like, uh, actually there's not many others. There's, there's the, 
the collection fee, the landfill fee, gross receipts, uh, and then there's miscellaneous fees for uh, additional pickups uh, and then um, uh, garbage bags. I mean, that's five thousand dollars. That's how small that is. Uh, so, but the total revenues we're, we're looking at is two point two million uh, five thousand three hundred seventy-five dollars. Uh, debt service is its portion of the um, the refinance because we how we uh, we borrowed the money for for the original uh, uh, pay as you throw program, and that will be for this fiscal year that we're we're looking at right now and next fiscal year the debt service taking up the portion of the 2012 bonds that we're paying off of that, and then it is paying $100,000 towards the 2011 bonds. The budget expenditures are $1,974,065, leaving us with the remaining balance of $59,000. <clears> this There is cushion in this budget right now for capital uh, expenditures. Uh, we do have... Uh, funds in there. Uh, I want to go back to this year. Um, with the current budget that we had, uh, we've we've done a lot of remediation at the our old landfill. We had to do a bunch of drainage remediation. It the fund paid for the a lot part of the design of the sports complex because it had to be designed according to the environment department's requirements because it's it was built on the landfill. And then it paid its portion of the debt service for the 2011 bonds, which was the refinance. So there, there was uh, a lot of extra uh, remediation and, and design costs that were included in last year's. Those are still budgeted for this year, even though most of them we won't be required to do. Um, but I do have them budgeted uh, just in case. Um, we are looking at, at purchasing a another side loader or replacing those burrows, what they're called, those brown garbage trucks. Uh, they don't make those anymore, so we're looking for something to replace it now. Um, but to purchase one of those vehicles, we do have this, that budget in this fund currently. Uh, as far as uh, personnel and everything, those are remaining the same. Uh, do you have any questions there? Uh, general fund, it's, it's, I haven't provided any numbers other than I'm going to give you some. I, I do have, I'm at a cur currently, I'm at a point where um, this is the, the, the philosophy that I took. Uh, the revenues that I projected is to 0% increase in gross receipts tax, taxes compared to this year. Where we're at. So those are the, the revenues that I looked at for next year. Uh, when you look at the different categories of revenues, the largest by far is the, the gross receipts taxes, which of the approximately 9.3 million total that we received this year, uh, approximately 8 million is uh, goes to the general fund. The others are separated between the 2012 uh, bond debt service, I mean 2011 bond debt service, the water sewer fund, the uh, sanitation fund, and the public safety tax. So th that's where the other parts of the gross receipts taxes go. Next f highest uh, source of revenue uh, is um, is the uh, franchise fees. Uh, we receive about $480,000 a year from franchise fees. The third is property taxes. We bring in about um, uh, $280,000, $290,000 a year. And, and that's never been raised as far as I can ever find back any, any time in the past. And uh, we have a lot of leeway to increase or, or work with that uh, property tax. Uh, so, you know, that's one of our smallest sources of revenue. That's actually the county's largest source of revenue. And the schools, 
so that's very small for our residents. Uh, then we have uh, use, user fees, which are like library fees, pools, um, and those types of, of costs. Actually, that's the, the, lowest, the smallest source of revenue. And the next is uh, fines and penalties, which are, are court, court fees. And we bring in about $160,000 in, in fines and penalties, it costs us approximately $280,000 uh, to um, operate the municipal courts. So we do subsidize. It's not a bringing in enough cash to pay for it. It's, it's subsidized by close to 50% there. But basically where, what I was looking at was to maintain uh, the current personnel uh, uh, levels in all the departments um, and operational levels in all the departments except for I'm proposing to increase uh, staffing levels at the police department and uh, working on some other issues there but um, that is the only major place of change within the general fund that we're looking at because if you look at public work public works which is in the general fund is, uh, consists of the parks, the swimming pool, the rec center, uh, the streets department, the um, city shop, and then administration. Uh, that department is, we feel that we've, we're doing real well at the current staffing levels uh, that we have, um, and we've got a lot of positive comments about all of our, our parks and we want to maintain that level of service for the community. Um, fire, there, there, they do, there is some budgeted increases in there because they do have a, a contract, a union contract that has annual increases. Uh, uh, it's a 1.5% annual increase, cost of living increase, as well as they do have uh, certification increases in there. So that's how they increase, they can increase their, it's not an automatic across the board uh, pay increase. They have to get certification increases. So they, they are p paid for progressing up the, the, the uh, education ladder, if you uh, look at it. Uh, union, uh, the police have a 1% cost of living increase. Uh, we are entering into negotiations with them uh, next week. Um, so, um, with that, um, that is the basic philosophy where I'm at. Um, the revenues currently do not cover the expenditures. It's not a, a, a long ways off, but um, I am working at, at looking at different things to, to balance, balance it and get the 112th reserve required. So, do you have any questions? Which brings us back to the property tax rate. Yes. Which I don't have the number in front of me, but we looked at it the other day. The town portion is like 0 .001. Mm -hmm. That's one penny per it's one dollar, one dollar per thousand dollars valuation. So that's very very low, and we may have to look at that at some point. Um. You know, I, I I looked at that. Um, the town can, on the operational side, which would go into the general fund, uh, the town can impose up to 7.65 mil towards operating the op the general fund. Currently, we have that one. It's it's one point. Currently, it's 1.5 mil. Uh, for non-residential and 2.3 something mills for non-residential. Now, I believe what happened was originally the town imposed one mill on on um, residential and two mills on non-residential. And the reason it's different is because to maintain the the static. Uh, revenue income uh, because the valuations change year to year tax and tax well tax and rev adjusts the 
the meal amounts to maintain that current that that um that revenue source too. So it's it's we've been receiving this two hundred and eighty thousand dollars in the same area as far back as I could find. And and, and I'm talking I went back about twenty years. So I went back as far as I could could go. So it hasn't changed. Uh, if we increased it by one mil on both sides, property taxes, uh, a home valued at twenty two hundred thousand dollars, a property, a residence valued at two hundred thousand dollars, right now pays twenty dollars to the town in property taxes. If it's doubled, we're talking a twenty dollar increase per year for per residence. So we're not talking about a lot of dollars uh, per year. Actually, the water rates and sewer rates increases is actually more than what we would be looking at property taxes. So that is something that we're looking at as well. So. Any discussion? Just a, just a quick comment. Just a... Uh, in that modest term, you know, just going up $20 in, in that case, um, that seems palatable and, and worth looking at. We, we do want to be careful with property taxes because that is a big driver um, for what makes us attractive. Uh, so so we, we want to tread lightly on that, but uh, under the premise that it's a mo a modest as that is, and we also have to take into consideration what the county's doing, what the uh, schools are doing, because it might just be $20 added to the county's $50 increase, added to the school's $50 increase. So, so we want to be careful when we do that, just because it is such a... We have generally probably higher um, cost of housing than, than maybe some of the surrounding area, and we just want to make sure that we, we remain competitive and, and uh, don't under, undermine uh, other, other things that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, I, I did look at... That, um, I looked at the count. I looked at the whole state's property taxes, and we are in the bottom one third of the state. And in fact, we're at the bottom one third of the one third because we're 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 really low. And the one thing that, uh, as going towards your comment about what impacts it might have on top of schools and and the county, the county is maxed out. So. <laughs> It's one of the few counties that is maxed out, so we don't have to worry about any increases at the county level. It, it would only be at the school level if, if we sign anything. Sure. Well, I, I think it's good that we're discussing it because um, I, I didn't know that we were way at the bottom um, talking with my colleagues on the municipal league board it seems that we're way at the bottom since many communities, municipalities seem to be maxed out already on their property taxes. Yes, in, in fact, um, during our gross receipts tax, yes. tax task force, um, that's where I, I, I first learned how low we were was because one of the proposals was to give up all of our remaining operating uh, Mills to the state in exchange for keeping our hold harmless amount. Um, then I went. We went back and we started talking amongst ourselves, and and most everybody was maxed out except us. We we only had one compared to seven. So I think, well, we're the only ones giving up here. <laughs> so I didn't really like that. Yeah. I, I do think it's something that. Um, Although we don't like doing things like that with the looming loss of the hold harmless and the fact that, as you said, currently we're, you're looking at uh, ways to mitigate the fact that um, expenses slightly exceed our, our revenues. And it's something that has to be considered because we want to continue to provide the same level of services that we've always provided to our citizens. and to all the people that come into town every day. Um, it's uh, problematic because our citizens are taking care of that as well. Um, 
except for water sewer, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just, you know, the fire. The and, and, and part of the issue with the way the, the approach that the state took at the hold, with the hold harmless is that municipalities like ourselves, mm -hmm. we have a population. The state looks at us at, like we're 10,300. But when you look at us from within, we serve a population on a daily basis of approximately 18,000 people in and out of Silver City each day. So, you know, the residents from the surrounding areas do provide additional revenue from the gross receipts taxes that they provide to the community through the different uh, transactions that they make. But the problem is, is that You've got 18,000 people coming into town that we're providing services for. The only source of, the only thing that everybody did buy when they came into town was food. So that was the one thing that everybody did pay their portion of the tax on. But now, just those people that do uh, those other types of transactions within Silver City are taking up the the slack for for that other portion that we're losing. And that's why Silver City was amongst one of the biggest losers percentage-wise of any community in the state because we we're going to lose approximately 18% of our total gross receipts taxes. And we have to find some way of, of mitigating that. While still providing services. While still providing those same services. Sure. For the record, I, I've met with Representative Martinez and Senator Morales in the last two weeks. And for the record, both of them voted in support of us and opposed the, the tax bill that was ramrodded through the legislature. And dis, in discussions with the senator, you know, I, I pointed out that there's little bills that they run that, that really feel good, like removing gross receipts from durable medical equipment and dialysis. Well, those are just additional cuts to us. And they're not doing an analysis of where we're at and how do we adjust to those those cuts when you add those into the whole into the what was whole harmless pot. And they continuously do that. And when you look at the FIRs on a lot of these um, bills that come out, they're, they don't mention how local governments are going to adjust. It's all about the state's general fund. And that's, that's just not a global picture of the effect of the bill. And Senator Morales and, and Representative Martinez are both very aware of our concerns. Representative Martinez is the former mayor, and so he knows quite well where his revenue came from and, and what all these bills would have done to it. And Senator Morales is very interested in, in working with us and making sure that he that he represents us and takes care of our our constituents that we share with him. And I, I think it's going to be important that we we work in the future years to really develop some stability in local government's revenue sources. Yeah, it's, it's very hard right now because we don't have a lot of control other than reacting to legislation that they enact. Example today, here's a reaction to the legislation they enacted recently. And that's all we can do is, is react right now. So it's, but you can only react to a certain point. Um, it's, it's sort of just passing the buck down to us to we're going to cut taxes so you can raise them down there so we don't have to worry about it um, and, and one thing that, that I going along with the Silver City being one of the biggest impacted by the whole harmless is the fact that when you look at every bill that they're holding they're looking to protect small communities 10,000 population is what they consider a small community. Well, we've got 300 too many people to be a small community, but so we're lumped in with the large communities. 
and we have to react with the large communities. And so that's that that's something that even on the national level, because they use the same the same number. So um, it, it's Silver City is the only community that doesn't get small cities uh, grants from the, the federal level because of that 10,000 uh, population limit. Um, we're the only one in Grant County, and, and you know we help when we we'll work very well with other communities. But it, we can only work to a certain point with them because of if we're, we're too involved, they may get eliminated from being able to apply for those funds as well. So, you know, it's it's a it's a catch twenty two. Any other discussion, Mr. Mayor? Council. It, it uh, you know the the picture painted isn't isn't great, and there's not a lot to work with. Um, but what it does uh, bring to mind, and I'm just going to talk more philosophically as opposed to giving gen direct guidance or anything like that. But uh, if if projection or if, if uh, revenues do come in above projections, if if we do have opportunities, we basically need to take care of ourselves, especially in light of what the state's doing. Um, how do we take care of ourselves? Is we need to take care of uh, those economic drivers that we have that can stimulate gross receipts um, and, and can stimulate economic activity that, that uh, um, increases uh, those, um, those gross receipts at an expedited uh, or an exponential um, level. Some of the things that I think about are the facts that, um, you know, just looking at it from a business standpoint, how, how do businesses handle this? Is, they have to look at where they're different from others. They they look at that differentiation, and, and when you when you really look at Silver City, it's um, it's our history, culture, and, and um, flavor that that attracts people. It attracts professionals to come make less money than than they would elsewhere. Um, it's it's an important thing. It, it helps um, the hospitals, the universities. Um, the, the legal firms, the accounting firms that attract people at lower rates and, and, and keeps people coming in in spite of maybe a, a lower economy or a lower standard of living. And we, we need to make sure we foster that and, uh, and, and if we do have any increases of revenue and, and we have some organizations or, or uh, some of our community leaders coming in with uh, potential opportunities for, for boosting our economy. and we, I, I, I hope we, we can keep that in mind and, and uh, help foster that and um, keep that stimulated. Very well said. I was going to say. Any other discussion? I was just going to say tourism, tourism, tourism. We talked about that a little bit tonight, and I think that some of the things that George talked about, and I think what's going to come to pass will bring more people into town and will hopefully um, bring more business to folks that live here and run businesses and to our um, various uh, different um, retail as well as other outlets. So I think all combined, if we all work together, it'll move forward. But I think we have to take everything into consideration in terms of what's going forward for making sure that the town does um, provide services and continue to do that. Um, and I think making sure we have that 112 reserve that we have to have as well. Yeah, it's important. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. If there's no other discussion on that topic, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session for number five. Number five? Shouldn't be long. It's collective bargaining negotiating strategy. Mr. Mayor. Councilor. I'm going to look at the uh, council go into executive session pursuant to NMSA 1978 section 10-15-1H for the following reason. Five. Um, we use for the discussion of bargaining strategy preliminary to collective bargaining negotiations. Mr. Mayor, I second that motion. There's a motion and a second to go into executive session, so I'm going to say 1978 section 1051 h 
For the following reasons, number five, meeting for the discussion of bargaining strategy preliminary to collective bargaining negotiations between and Roll call. Councilor Wilson? Aye. Councilor Cook? Aye. Councilor Lane? Aye. Councilor Morales? Aye. Motion carries will be in a short recess and then we'll be in executive session. We'll take no action when we return.